Week 2. The Explorers Since the mid-1980s, scholars have grown accustomed to talking about the literature of discovery as a literature about cultural conflict, and bringing together these works from a century or so before the English colonies really began to take root, we have found a compelling drama in the opening encounters between a European and Native American character and about the effect that each wider culture had on the other. The two main types of writings during this time were centered on the clash of multiple cultures. First, the explorers wrote letters and reports, or briefs, which are written to court officials, narrating voyages and containing descriptions of the New World, especially that of the land, a valuable commercial asset to European powers and merchants, and the inhabitants, which could be seen as an opportunity to spread Christianity. Since writings contain such rich imagery and descriptions of the lush environment and the people of the Americas, the imaginations of the Europeans were stirred. The purpose of these writings was to inform and influence policy. An example of this type of writing can be seen in Columbus's point-by-point -point description of his second voyage addressed to Ferdinand and Isabella. Second, the explorers wrote what was known as literature of witness, which described the devastation in the New World. Mistreatment of the natives inspired an outpouring of written expression. This can be seen in Bartolomé de las Casas' writings, in which he told about Spain's ruthless destruction of whole peoples in America. Life in the New World was harsh. Despite centuries of propaganda stating that the Indians were innately savage, the Europeans actually had the technological edge in warfare and were, in turn, more violent. Native peoples died in large numbers, if not from war, then from enslavement, brutal mistreatment, despair, or disease such as smallpox, measles, and typhus. The constant battles along vague frontiers with native peoples added fuel to the political infighting among the settlers themselves, whose riots and mutinies nearly ruined settlement after settlement. Distance from the homeland also played a major role in the failure to control the colonies. The question of a truly American identity continues into our studies on the explorers. How are these writings considered American literature? Much of this material was written by Europeans who never thought of themselves as belonging to any other place other than their homeland. The majority of these writings were also not originally written in English. Additionally, the form in which they are written do not resemble the literature that most of you are already familiar with, such as poems, fictional narratives, or dramatic performances. However, great value can still be found within these texts. For example, they can serve as precursors to a literary tradition that will flower in the 18th and 19th centuries. They are also texts that, while not necessarily written as literature, nevertheless employ the type of creative use of language that appears in poems, novels, and plays. Just like fictional texts, the writings create protagonists and antagonists, they have plots filled with action, conflict, transformation, and growth. And they instill in readers a sense of wonder, sympathy, hope, or fear. Cabeza de Vaca's narrative, for example, may be a first-person account of a Spanish explorer lost in the Southwest, but it is also, like Homer's Odyssey and Defoe's Robinson Crusoe, a heroic tale of wandering through exotic locales that leads its protagonist to a profound self-discovery. Finally, this section can also help you consider the idea that the most interesting early writings from North America, writings in which the continent and its indigenous people had an impact on the consciousness of the European visitor, were all products of the English explorations and migrations. This week, we will be reading from the letters, diaries, and narratives of three of the most famous explorers. The first explorer we will look at is Christopher Columbus. Though he has often been styled into a heroic figure and taught to elementary school students as the great discoverer of America, Columbus has, in fact, inspired much controversy among scholars ever since he developed his bold plan to establish a new trade route to the eastern lands of India and Japan by sailing west from Europe. Although he failed in his attempt to reach Asia, he did land in the Bahamas in the Caribbean, where he laid the foundation for European colonization of that region. Since the 15th century, cultural commentators have argued over the nature of Columbus's accomplishment, his management of the Spanish colonies established in the Caribbean, his treatment of the Native Americans who lived there, 
and especially his claim to the status of discoverer of America, have provoked a variety of reactions. Columbus's reputation has long been troubled by the fact that his successes in navigation and exploration cannot be separated from the legacy of exploitation and violence that mark European involvement in the New World. Any account of his writings and his deeds must begin with the acknowledgement that Columbus's discovery of the Americas led to the destruction as of much of four-fifths of the native population of the region. Columbus was born in Genoa, but left Italy to train as a sailor and navigator. Although many of his contemporaries dismissed his plan to sail westward as impractical and misguided, Columbus eventually convinced King Ferdinand and Queen Isabella of Spain to finance an exploratory voyage in 1492. Five months after setting sail from Granada, Columbus and his crew landed in the Bahamas and immediately claimed possession of the land for Spain by reading a proclamation that was certainly incomprehensible to the natives. Columbus recorded his impressions of the voyage, the islands, and the natives in a logbook and in letters that he sent to his backers in Spain. Impressed with Columbus's inflated claims about the rich natural resources and wealth of the islands, Ferdinand and Isabella published his letters in Europe to assert their possession of this territory. Anxious to secure their control before other European powers could move into the region, the Spanish monarchs quickly sent Columbus on a second voyage in 1493. Columbus returned to the island he had named Hispaniola to discover that all of the Spanish settlers he had left behind were dead, presumably because they had antagonized the natives. Columbus attempted to enslave them and establish a new Spanish colony in Hispaniola, but the settlement soon devolved into rancor and violence after Columbus left to explore other islands in the region. He was forced to return to Spain in 1496 to settle the many political disagreements in which he had become embroiled. Upon his return to Europe, Columbus found his reputation tarnished by reports of his poor management of the colony. Nevertheless, he managed to convince the Spanish monarchs to fund a third voyage in 1498 and a final fourth voyage in 1502. Upon his return, he found the settlers in an open revolt against Columbus's inflexible management style. Refusing to recognize him as their leader, the colonists placed him under arrest and sent him back to Spain. With his health ruined and his reputation damaged, he died in 1506, bitter about his colony's failure to provide him with the wealth and recognition he expected, and never knowing he had discovered a new world. Sometimes celebrated as the conscience of Spanish colonization, Bartolomé de las Casas was one of the first Europeans to recognize and protest the cruel treatment of Native Americans at the hands of their conquerors. By drawing on his considerable political, legal, and ecclesiastical connections, he became a powerful and eloquent force in agitating for Indian rights. While growing up and studying in the Spanish city of Seville, Casas closely followed the news of the conquistadors and their exploits in the New World. In 1502, Casas joined an expedition to Hispaniola, where he participated in the brutal conquest of the Indians and received land and slave labor in return for his services. After over a decade of overseeing Indian slaves, Casas experienced a dramatic change of heart, perhaps precipitated by his decision to join the Dominican Order of Catholic Priests. He became convinced that the Spanish encomienda, or slave system, was unjust and unchristian, and he soon devoted himself towards working towards its abolishment. While his commitment to Indian rights made him unpopular with many Spanish colonists and leaders, Casas never again wavered in his conviction that Native Americans deserved to be treated with respect and humanity. While he at one point advocated using African slaves to replace Indian labor, he later realized the hypocrisy of his proposal and renounced the idea, instead opting to oppose the enslavement of any peoples. Casas' monumental The Very Brief Relation of the Devastation of the Indies is among his most important writings. Here, Casas offers a devastatingly vivid expose of the brutality of the Spanish slave system. He also drew on his intimate knowledge of Indian culture to combat the popular argument that the natives were so docile, submissive, and mentally inferior as to be natural slaves. 
finally, Alvar Nunez Cabeza de Vaca composed his relation to narrate his extraordinary experience as a Spaniard who became integrated into Native American culture in the New World. Cabeza de Vaca set sail with Panfilo de Narvaez in 1527 on an expedition to chart the Gulf Coast. After Narvaez, an incompetent leader, lost the ships under his command through a series of misadventures, he left his crew marooned in Florida. After a plan to construct new ships ended in a disaster at sea, Cabeza de Vaca and the other few survivors from the expedition found themselves shipwrecked on the coast of present-day Texas and enslaved by the Indians of the region. Cabeza de Vaca responded to his predicament and freed himself from slavery by learning the Native Americans' language and adapting himself to their culture, though he never relinquished hope of eventually finding a Spanish outpost and being reunited with his countrymen. To this end, he began traveling north and west through North America, drawing on his skills as a trader and especially as a healer to the grateful tribes he encountered. Combining Christian rituals with traditional Native American customs, Cabeza de Vaca operated as a shaman or spiritual healer and acquired fame, respect, and power for his ability to heal and comfort the sick. Cabeza de Vaca and a small group of other survivors from the Narvaez expedition reached present-day New Mexico in 1535. They gathered a large contingent of Native American followers and headed south to Mexico, hoping to find a Spanish settlement there. But when they eventually encountered a group of Spaniards, Cabeza de Vaca was appalled by their eagerness to enslave the natives and soon found himself in conflict with them. In his narrative, he ironically refers to these Spanish settlers by the same disparaging term the Indians used, Christian slavers. After finally returning to Spain in 1537, he continued to speak out against the conquistadors' mistreatment of Native American peoples. For this week's discussion, compare and contrast the different descriptions of the natives and the land given in the written works of each of the three explorers we have studied. Why do you believe they have chosen to represent the Indians so differently? Use clear examples from each of the readings to support your argument.